what I wanted to talk about is what you call the emotional bridge. What does that mean? Sure. <clears throat> well, every day, um, my capital uh, needs to find some level of expression across different markets. Um, like I said, I look at um, all different types of um, factors, whether it's my uh, risk tolerance, my, uh, my objective structure, my duration, all these different values. Um, and then I have to understand very clearly where in the market cycle we are and what is my tolerance or my understanding of my ability to participate at that point in the market cycle. And your ability can be largely and definitely impaired by the behavioral factors that are in that head of yours. You know, I always start from know what you don't know, which I'm always prepared uh, to be ill-equipped to deal with things that happen suddenly. <laughs> So the challenge for me is... That's such a market guy thing to say. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I hate surprises, and, and you know, they can be very expensive. Yeah, well, but, but journos who've never played the game would never say that. Well, but I, you know, I, I, again, we, you know, we're, we're changing. This, this entire information ecosystem is changing yep. where more and more experts across more and more fields are going to be delivering opinions um, to people that are going to benefit from it. Absolutely. This is the most, at least one of the most critical points. Pro to pro, you need to learn from the pros. Ray Dalio, and again, this is part of your emotional bridge. This quote by Ray Dalio is timeless in this regard. Successful people know that nature is testing them, and it's not that sympathetic. Yeah. So how do I equip myself every single day? Um, although I'm an active trader, I'm, I don't trade every day, but I'm certainly prepared. I've got to be uh, capable of understanding the world as it evolves. Um, and the emotional bridge is all the different investor impediments. Um, that, that confront you every single day. So even though I may, in my heart of hearts, understand what the right disposition, the right allocation of mm -hmm. capital across all the different accounts and all the different buckets, getting the money to the market in the, in the time that is, is appropriate to do so mm -hmm. sometimes is very, very difficult. But it's the most important thing, it, at least we try to communicate it, and it's kind of interesting to watch people on the outside attempt to understand what we're talking about. But is it not the timestamp? The signal, what you are really looking for is somebody to hit you upside the head and say, do this now. Well, one of the things I used to publish very actively was an expected range calculation. I used to put the calculation out for anybody to use. It was Excel. fantastic. So it, yeah. it helped me. And by the way, I, I watched the interaction on Twitter on that. I would say 90% of people had no idea what it was. I thought it was one of the best things that I could add to my process. And when you, when you stop putting sure. it up, it's like, man, yeah. I need that thing. Well, yeah. all I was trying to do was make myself aware of where in the daily range exactly. I, was, I was transacting. Because you don't want to buy the highs and you don't want to sell the lows. At the very least, you need to know where they are. Mm -hmm. So every, every day, there is some expected range. Now, there's a lot of debate about what the right series of calculations are to, d to yeah. deliver the width of the range. I probably spend, I, I don't know how many man hours a day uh, that I spend on specific sure. tasks, but that would be number one. In, if I, in terms of time allocation, tweaking, constantly tweaking the sure. factors and the parameters right. within my expected range. Right. That's the most critical thing, and it's dynamic. And do you have the courage at the time that's appropriate to do so to transact at the level of the range where you are? I mean, ultimately, you know, green needs to be low, red needs to be high. It's really <laughs> hard to do. Well, it's, um, it's, it's even harder in the social media, you know, kind of news stream that you can see because they're, I think you call them passive, what do you call them, passive trend followers? Editorial passive trend followers. Oh, editorial passive trend followers. Well, because it, it, it's easy to talk about how high the market is after it's gone high. It's easy to talk about how low the market is yeah. after it's gone low. But what you're actually seeing, I'm actually finding, you know, go back 15 years and I look at my decision making process, and I think of it again like don't swing at outside pitches, or again, don't sure. buy high and don't s sure. you know, sell low. And it's getting easier because I see the almost the contra stream of, of that kind of editorial passive trend commentary. That really gives me my spot. That gives me the fear. It, it, it's one of it the things. That, the low end of my range. It's one of the things that identifies a period of time, but we we have no idea how wide that period of time is. Right. Meaning, meaning people can be um, wrong for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, ultimately, I know that every single day I work on learning, on listening. Um, I love the interaction that I had on Twitter. There were so many different people that genuinely reached out to me um, and thanked me. Were appreciative of the explanation, the expertise. Yep. Um, and I think things are only going to get more interesting going forward because, let's put it this way, I think the right answer has never been worth more. Um, and you'll find that out quickly when you see a more meaningful acceleration on the downside. Yeah. Well, I mean, we haven't had that in really any asset class 
particularly equity-oriented asset class, yeah. in quite some time. It was interesting to watch, though, in fixed income last year, yeah. because as we would call it, the point of entropy sure. was very visible. Yeah. I mean, bond yields to us, we got the signal that bond yields were going to, we called it rates rising, that yeah. they were going to break out at the end of April, early May. We got very few phone calls from traditional fixed income managers when we put that signal out. I had more long, short equity guys La get short the bond yeah, market right. on that signal. Yeah. But again, th you saw some serious pain on that move. Immediate. On, on the 10-year on the yield. Serious move and rate. immediate. Yep. And then you saw the shrapnel, which, were, you know, which is another thing maybe you could discuss on the bridge. How does it, how does it matter to the big player on the bridge, the, you know, the big gorilla, Bill Gross, was standing on the bridge and he was off the bridge? What happens? Yeah, well, um, first of all, don't get, don't get killed. I mean, you know, you know, put yourself in a position where you still have the ability to move. But you see that, that, that so if they're not going to get killed, what, to me at least, the behavioral response was, this can't be happening because this isn't going according to the, to the prior well, rules. Well, I, I, I can tell very clearly, although, although I wasn't active on Twitter at that point, you know, I was buying um, the MUB index, I was buying yep. um, the TLT, uh, and putting myself in a position where I was buying enough for it to be worthy of, of attention, mm -hmm. but not enough that if there was a continued acceleration to the upside in terms of yields. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, in August and early September, I think I bought the TLT six different times at an average 10-year yield of something like 279.50, mm -hmm. 282, something yep. like that. And at that point, people were very clear that 310 was a chip shot for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, again, when you go back and look at where those securities were at the middle of May, the beginning of May, remember there was a Wall Street Journal article at the beginning of May, bond funds are, harding it, are finding a hard time finding more bonds. <laughs> th th that was, Classic. you know. So th the challenge always is, is having some kind of schedule of deployment, mm -hmm. of having, I like dividing things in even parts, mm -hmm. um, and it makes sense to me, I'm comfortable with it. Dividing the, your order flow into Yeah, I, I divide a, a value by half and then yep. by half, and, and I come up with meaningful pieces of capital that I can bid below the market. And, you know, I try to put myself in a position of understanding both the trajectory of the market and some kind of range calculation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I literally play a game. Can I consistently buy in the lower half of the range? Can I consistently sell? It, it truly is a game. I think some people don't, who haven't played the game would never understand why you call it a game. But obviously one of the I, best. I'm, I'm not being disparaging. Yeah. No, I'm, it's, I'm, not. I'm, um, it's not. You you know, know. One of the best books ever written, and I suggest everyone reads it, it's called The Money Game. I mean, go back, read it. It was written at a very important time in the market. Uh, and I think that a lot of the things that you're bringing to the table here are things that we can dig into uh, more and more and more because we're sure. going to constantly be learning about these things. But again, if you're making decisions on that emotional bridge, you don't want to buy the highs and you don't want to sell the lows. What you want to do is establish a repeatable process. Like Buddy said, separate it into equal parts. Separate it into whatever it is that you do, but be consistent. Because then you're going to at least take the risk of being really wrong out a little bit, which is really what we're all tasked with doing. So thank, thank you very much. If you have any questions on this, I'm at Keith McCullough. He's Buddy Carter.